Namaskar and welcome to BIC Talks a podcast by Bangalore International Center bringing you conversations that move inform and encourage discourse when bijom started we i didn't even know then because i was so uninformed but we actually acquired very bad soil this uh, patch of land which i took over was just like ash you know and it's only when i started talking to local farmers and trying to grow in the first year that i realized that this is very poor soil it had no organic matter it had no life there was nothing in it it was just gray gray ash and literally and it was like beach sand you know my legs would sink into the ankles when i walked it was that bad over 8 years now i found liquid fertilizers very useful because of the large area of land that we were occupying and so i used a lot of abrigella jivamrit because that was easy for me to uh, use and i cannot tell you how the soil is transformed with an increasing number of urban city dwellers finding their way back to agriculture There is a small but definite movement towards natural organic alternative methods of sustainable farming. While there has been stress on constant productivity to make economic sense in the last century, we are now becoming aware of how much damage the land, food cultures and native knowledge systems have experienced. As they wait for policy to catch up, two people talk about what moves them. to take an active interest in sustainability preservation and conservation in this episode of BIC talks ecological conservationist priya shanavas speaks with lawyer turned farmer and innovator aparna rajgopal about lessons learned while setting up her self sustained off the grid model farm bijom and several projects that it houses like preserving and growing traditional heirloom and native varieties of crops a seed bank and preserving endangered varieties of indigenous cattle over to priya hello aparna i am priya and thank you so much for speaking to us today hi priya hi i i must say that you know the the more i read and and watch i am just uh, fascinated uh, fascinated by the story of pijom the story of dangho the story of khet se pet tak but for me essentially it's it's the story of how land has come alive uh, in the loving hands of aparna and the farmers of bijom thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> so it it would be great if you could tell us i mean amongst all these stories there's so many stories to to hear today but first the story of uh, ganga the horse and how boarding her uh, led to be jo thank you so much for inviting me to this forum i must uh, first uh, thank you all and uh, yeah we jo started quite unexpectedly and it's something that i never anticipated first introduce myself i uh, grew up in chennai i my I, i grew up in a uh, my dad was a doctor my mom was a homemaker and and i grew up in a regular urban household and then went on to do law in bangalore uh, and then i moved to delhi to work and i realized very early on that uh, the kind of work i wanted to do was just not fitting in with the regular mainstream legal profession but i couldn't find what i wanted to do i kept doing a lot of things i i wrote stuff for people and i worked freelance in a lot of places and worked with lots of animal organizations and environment organizations and at some point i learned music i think i was kind of uh, but can i say drifting and in 2014 in one of my animal rescue you know one of my friend who has a lovely organization she uh, animal rescue organization shelter she suggested that i take in a horse and at first it was a big joke at home because we are a f- urban family living in an urban space no land so my husband and i it just idea just stuck and we said why don't we lease a small patch of land and look after the horse and our children were at that point learning to ride so we thought it's a wonderful opportunity to give them a hands on experience of raising a horse and looking after the horse and the idea of going every weekend and riding the horse and you know spending time that kind of stuff what we didn't anticipate was that when we went to look for this land uh, close to noida in the suburb 
Noida is a suburb, the national capital region. The uh, farmer said, why do you want one bigger to keep your horse? Because that's what we asked for. He said, take all 15. So I asked, what would we do with 15? I mean, we were, we were amused because we had no plans. And to be honest, until then I grew nothing, not even a chili plant in my house. So although the obviously like all of us, the idea of growing food and uh, farmlands are always very appealing, uh, but we had never uh, really done much about it. And uh, he said, uh, you, why don't you try to farm? You do your own farming because I have all this land and I want to give it to somebody to, on lease. So that's how uh, very, uh, as a very uh, crazy idea in Western UP, two South Indians decided to lease 15 bigas of land to farm. Uh, we didn't actually realize what we were taking on at that point. Because overnight, our responsibilities were suddenly all over the place. I mean, uh, I first of all had language issues. I didn't understand how to talk uh, terminologies. And we had to get people and we had to, what do we grow? How do we start? Where do we begin? Just clueless. I mean, so uh, there's one single jamun tree and a charpoy. I asked one of the villagers there for a charpoy to uh, plant myself with all my equipment, iPad, phone, you know, our, our new library is, in a, is, in, is all in gadgets. So I googled what is farming and the only thing possibly I knew was that I want to grow chemical free food. Uh, that was of course I think already there in my head. And then there was this horse that came along. And with her, for some reason, we took two more horses <laughs> because they followed us around in the shelter and we fell in love with them. One was actually a mule and the other two were thoroughbreds who had gone through three, actually. So four horses. So we named them Ganga, who was the first horse who we were going to take. Yamuna and Narmada, for some reason, they all became river names. And Kaveri. Kaveri is the mule. They're still there. Ganga, Yamuna, Narmada and Kaveri after eight years. Uh, this was in 2014, August. So then that's how it started with her, with the horse. Well, the farm then unfolded on its own over a period of eight years now. What I find amazing, Aparna, is that for Aparna the lawyer, who, uh, prior to Aparna the farmer, it's like many of us who have land on the outskirts of the city and like a weekend getaway. So even though many people grow, uh, you know, a few tomatoes on the side, it's very hard for an urbaner to give up. I mean, it's not that there were two parallel tracks. That's what most people do. They have a life in the city and farming is something you dabble with over the weekend. But but you didn't dip your toes in. You you just took the, <laughs> the full uh, deep plunge. So uh, how, how did that happen? Because it's quite courageous. Uh, I don't have to discourage, honestly. I think that's just, I think temperamentally, yes, if I love something, then I dive deep in uh, always. And personally, I've also realized I'm a self-learner. I love self-learning. I don't actually function well in structured educational spaces. I love freestyle learning where I actually get my hands dirty. And when I started, I mean, I, I didn't realize this was where I belong, honestly. Now, when I look back, I'm thinking, what was I doing? before this. So this was kind of an amazing journey the last eight years because when I started, like I told you, I knew nothing. So when I started Googling, I mean, at that point, I had three small children. So there was no way I could travel and do courses with other farms or get away for 20 days and do some retreat somewhere or a permaculture course. There was no way. I couldn't leave. My children were very small. So the universe was in my hand in an iPad or a phone. And I started hearing podcasts and seeing YouTube videos and reading PDFs. And the wealth of information on the internet is staggering, if you actually get into it and everything for my the farm became my lab and very early on so I started doing uh, Subhash Palekar's all his uh, you know whatever I could figure out from all his talks or his thing I started doing Bill Mollison's permaculture principles somewhere uh, I started reading about Bhaskar Save uh, I started reading about, of course uh, you know Aranya or uh, anybody there are so many people around India who are doing fabulous Thing. Then I read the One Straw Revolution. So I, I just I started reading books. I started reading. I think I became a voracious reader and I, and I started making notes. I filled notebooks and notebooks of notes in these last eight years. It became like an academic study for me. And the farm was a natural temptation. And so the passion came because the subject was just so beautiful. 
Farming is not something you can learn in one course or in or even just through googling. And when I say Google, I don't mean I just googled and I knew everything. Uh, it actually meant a lot of failures, a lot of foolishness, more than intelligence, and a lot of trial and error, and a lot of observation. Now we've done eight summers, eight winters, and eight springs. Every year is a learning of that set of crops of that season. of planting of harvesting so you know that is why i mean farming is something that i i realized that you have to be present so, you know there was no way i could be sitting in my house and remote controlling this and learn it could not have happened so i found the first 3 years i was perennially sunburned standing on the field and i frankly i think my family wasn't sure what i'm doing because at that point i myself wasn't sure what i'm doing my crops were full of insects i was either growing too much of something or everything failed but i knew one thing that across what i had read the language or the message was the same keep at it you know and you will see light <laughs> so that uh, i just kept at it because I, i honestly it's not like any of us know where something is heading so i think there are two things that i learned there's no instant fix everybody wants to know the trajectory or a path there is no path everybody wants a graph about what will happen you don't know so it was a blind kind of journey initially but by the third year i really started understanding the land i started seeing monsoon differently from when i saw it 3 years ago sitting in my house <laughs> now monsoon meant something completely different i started realizing what's coming my way first year i had no clue what can happen now i could anticipate कि ये हो सकता है एंड पर्टिकुलरली नेचुरल फार्मिंग यू हैव टू ऑब्जर्व योर एलिमेंट्स ऑब्जर्व द सॉइल ऑब्जर्व योर प्लांट्स ऑब्जर्व इंसेक्ट बिहेवियर ऑब्जर्व बर्ड लाइफ एवरीथिंग इज कंट्रीब्यूटिंग टू दिस प्रोसेस एंड ऑनेस्टली आई आई वाज वेरी मूव्ड बाय हाउ लिटिल वी नो सिटिंग इन आवर होम्स एंड थिंकिंग वी आर वेरी वेल एजुकेटेड <laughs> from what i understand aparna uh, this is like, like a crash course in restoration ecology because so much has been achieved from 2014 uh, and it's it's all about the land coming alive right so two things come to mind was it something that was planned as a philanthropic venture or did you uh, think of it being self sustaining Uh, at some point that's the first and the second part is as far as sustainability goes how long did it take from the time that you acquired the land to the first trickle of revenue coming in you know was that the time period that you were prepared for because many people were wrong in their estimation and unfortunately that derails things so just to know how, what did you have in mind when you started and how did it actually evolve it's a question i find hard to answer but i'm getting better at this because this has been such an organic uh, growth in the last say 8 years i have to actually structure my answer so to answer your first question when i began i had no clue all this is going to happen we just like i said we just thought we'll have a backyard garden literally and we had told ourselves that it's only a lease so let's try this for a year Uh, you know considering I, grew, you, i i knew how to grow nothing we were not sure how this is going to go right so we said okay let's have some fun for a year and if we can't we'll return the rest to the land that's how it started so honestly in the first year there was or first two years there was no plan of any kind right but once i started i couldn't stop because the subject just drew me in and i started doing all kinds of things and as i started growing this in a very excited even now when i reach the farm i'm perennially excited about what we can do because the possibilities are just sitting in front of me in the farm right so people started coming first friends then people uh, by word of mouth and they started coming in we started getting cattle in our first few cattle came in then our cattle shed grew then i realized about indigenous cattle we started collecting indigenous cattle and at no point did we realize that we are actually growing something an idea or a, at that point suddenly at some point we had to sit back and say hey listen where is this going because this was also uh, what started as a small project is also going to now like you said yes it's going to cost us to run this you know the expenses began to grow and 
as the expenses grew i also realized i need to develop a sustainable model to showcase what we are doing my husband and i both are from law school and he is in the profession and i kind of now spend my all my time doing this uh, but we were very clear that this is what we want to invest in and uh, you know work with this is our passion this is our joy although we were spending our money uh, at some point and we still do but the i need to make this a sustainable and self earning project became very clear uh, in the in about the third year because when farmers started visiting us and they wanted to know the economics they wanted to know how this they can do this we wanted to showcase this as a very sustainable model then of course the need was also there because as the project grew our expenses grew and we needed to earn back for the farm right we never thought of accepting donations or creating an ngo that was never the idea the idea was to have a private farm project that will be a sustainable project where we work towards earning for our project and that was that has been the idea that is still the idea so we don't take any donations of any kind everything is aimed at how to uh, creating models of revenue and we've realized you know, there is a plethora of models available to us so what we first began with just selling our vegetables to people who would come then we started a farmers market 7 years ago on the farm the idea was let people come in and buy vegetables then we had seven rescued horses and rehabilitated completely so we started a small riding school so that they can earn their own keep at the same time they exercise horses need exercise so instead of them in being just be to run round and round we thought it can we can also get some kids to come interact learn because kids uh, need to come to these kind of spaces they need to interact they need to it develops them in so many ways then we realized that we could work with dung we were very sure we didn't want to do dairy and our cattle shed was growing because we were adding beautiful indigenous cattle to our project that's a cattle preservation project we have about 11 breeds we have uh, the gir sahiwal tarparkar let's in the kankre jarati malnad gidda kange bichu haryani beautiful breeds so the idea was it's a library of cattle actually and we don't do dairy so idea was to create a dung project so we started a dung project so we started building models of revenue which i'll talk about as the you know conversation progresses but the need grew as the farm grew and the ideas grew organically we started getting new ideas of how farmers could use um, maybe their rural projects like dungho could be started maybe uh, every animal shelter could have a revenue model like this then uh, we, every uh, every farm should have a for direct selling like a farmers market we started value adding our produce and selling it creating packaging small bottles of pickles or jams or our uh, flour or whatever in surplus that we had we began to find ways to sell it so i think it just grew very very organically we didn't have a plan as such but i realized that what bijom can do it it can it can have so many small ideas which we can show as a template of how farming economy can be improved and we were making mistakes and correcting them and trying to perfect a template it could help somebody else that has become the hallmark of bijom where we first evolve a template stumble through it for make our mistakes learn from it over one or two years and then we are ready to share it with somebody so our own needs became you know models for ourselves and something we could share with others so that's how it's kind of grown and that's how the revenue model is model is also grown alongside so it's from what i understand there are there are four major parts to this there is the the farming there is the animal uh, shelter there are the value added products like dango which i think is uh, something very close to my heart i would really love to talk <laughs> about it exclusively after this and third of course is the self help groups and the events and all which happen so and the the, the farm which is beautiful because it is a cruelty free farm right you are you work very hard to promote the concept that animals should be loved just for who they are and not for what they give us and when you look at a cow that that fundamental shift if you know just looking at her as milk when you look at a goat you just look at it as meat 
So uh, that's 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 really beautiful because the foundation of that is, is love and service. But is the room open uh, for uh, a small farmer? Does does someone who doesn't have hundred and twenty cows? He has just a few cows and uh, and uh, you know a little bit of sheep. And is are these options of not looking at milk? being a revenue uh, generator not looking at and only looking at the dung is that even an option for a for a smaller farmer this is a very good question because everybody who comes to bijom asks me this question when they come and see the scale of the cow shed or the or scale of operation they immediately say can we do this and i keep telling them you don't have to do everything we are doing take away what you can and apply it in any way you can where you live so it's very interesting but the whole of india actually uh, is full of small holdings small farm holdings the larger farm holdings are very few 80% of if i'm right the statistics are about 80% of all agriculture holdings are small and traditionally we worked uh, each of these units were uh, was a universe by itself it had every farmer had some livestock he had some fields and first he ate well and then he gave to the world the surplus that's how it worked he did mixed cropping he followed traditional patterns right and i do agree that just this itself may not ensure food security so we may have to grow more and grow in different ways to ensure food security but what we have done is to ensure food security we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater we have put all the animals in factories farming communities are not interested in growing in keeping animals anymore they just want their tractor and their urea and that is what is tilted the whole balance even the village i live in most of the villagers here don't keep animals they all want to go to the city they find animals a burden now to look after because they earn much more when they go per day in a in a job than they do uh, with from an animal but if you want more holistic practices to come in we have to encourage people to go back to keeping some animals so i keep telling anyone who wants to start a small farm keep two bulls this is not about milk you only have four bigas of land use only a plow for four bigas you can easily use two bulls they give you the dung with the dung you can get your own many or two uh, so if somebody wants to start a small natural farm it is important that they bring in some animals because without animals you cannot make your farm holistic and sustainable it's not possible the most ancient link in civilization is between animals and farm and uh, humans we became a civilization because we had such we created those kind of systems where we began to live together whether it was poultry or whether it was cows or whether it was and there was a very hum- humane a uh, way of interacting with them they were not there just for your for you it was a symbiotic relationship where a van had cattle it was here always a small cattle shed where he had a couple of bulls one or two cows and he took from them what they gave there was no demand and the uh, because if there was milk he had milk at home the cow, if the cow was giving milk when the cow didn't he drank black coffee or black tea or herb tea or whatever he uh, he drank similarly the bulls were there to plow the bulls were there to pull his cart the bulls the dung was there for building his home or you know fuel or uh, putting in the fields so uh, and what he harvested the fodder went to his cow the seed went to him the roots went back to the soil so it was the the small holdings were so symbiotic the whole relationship between the animal and the man he got a few eggs from the poultry the hens you know kind of grazed on his land they picked up all the caterpillars from some crop <laughs> i think the it was a very gentle symbiotic way of living so if people want to do natural farming or want to get into this kind of organic farming it's not just about not using pesticides or clean food has come to mean just say no pesticides it's clean no it also has to be regenerative very over exploited word sustainable but for want of a better word i'm still using it regenerative and sustainable is it's it's it has to be your lands have to be that and that that is only possible if you bring in farm animals it's my view they have to come out of factories in the way they have uh, now become they, they the way they are 
locked into these horrible chambers of where they spend all their lives just producing something and never see grass never see the sky there is something very tragic about that and um, so we do for me this kind of farming has come to mean that everyone can do it because everyone must do it if you want to regenerate your soil you have to do it when bijom started we i didn't even know then because i was so uninformed but we actually acquired very bad soil this uh, patch of land which i took over was just like ash you know and it's only when i started talking to local farmers and trying to grow in the first year that i realized that this is very poor soil it had no organic matter it had no life there was nothing in it it was just gray gray ash I and mean, literally and it was like beach sand you know my legs would sink into the ankles when i walked it was that bad over 8 years now i found liquid fertilizers very useful because of the large area of land that we were occupying and so i used a lot of abrijal or jivamrit because that was easy for me to uh, use and i cannot tell you how the soil is transformed so for the other reason the why we need to bring in animals is uh, to regenerate soil immediately to start you do need good manure you need good farmyard manure it really really helps regenerate bad soil and then at some point other things like mulching and multi cropping and intercropping nitrogen fixing all these kind of things take over but initially bad soil needs this leg up and nothing can give it a better leg up than farmyard manure and your own farmyard manure which has no antibiotics which is clean which is produced from healthy stress free animals nothing like it. it in fact when you walk into our cow shed it's amazing you cannot there is no smell there's no stench because our, our cattle don't roam outside they don't eat plastic they don't uh, eat kachra and they don't you know graze on other things they just have clean fodder so why i i impress upon people doing integrated farming and using animals in any way they can because a for the animal uh to for the people themselves which is it's much it's a better healthier lifestyle for a farmer to have animals within his uh land three for the soil nothing better for soil than good farmyard manure four i have one more reason we have no crops to burn on our farm there's nothing called crop burning in bijo every straw goes back to the for as for so it's because farmers don't have animals that crop is burned because they don't need uh, the fodder otherwise fodder is the most precious commodity nobody burns any fodder they keep it for their uh, animals traditionally so so many reasons why i can tell you that animals are completely integral to our environment uh, there are 10 more reasons but this is the main four that i can okay so uh, continue on on this about dung ho which is amazing the, the kind of value from waste that can be generated and the complete range of products that you have i i looked around i mean we're in bangalore and i'm uh, quite moved by plants so plastic is available everywhere but something like this is 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 not available at all so it, so does that mean that this entire thing of of generating anything actually from a cow dung can only be a local project it's not something which can be marketed uh, on a on a bigger scale that's number one secondly i was wondering how how do you manage a, a mismatch because every day regardless of what happens you you do have 100 kg of dung showing up 1500 kg okay so if that many logs or pots and dias and opales and seed balls are not are not sold how do you manage such a large volume you have asked uh, a very complicated question <laughs> on an average a cow or a bull gives about 15 kilos of dung a day okay that's an average we have about 1500 kilos of dung in our farm every day it's a huge lot of dung which is why also the idea struck saying why are we after dairy because i need to digress to see uh, i un- i sat and studied dairy i like i said i'm not an economist or anything this was just i was trying to use my common sense to understand what could be so remarkable about the dairy business apart from the fact that milk is wonderful uh, i mean we are not here debating on the taste of milk i think we all love milk milk products they are great to taste but as a business 
you know why is dairy so big right a because a cow is pregnant 9 months so for 9 months she's just sitting in your cow shed let's look at it from a purely economic perspective right she gives milk actually for 7 months but by the 4th month after the birth of the uh, calf the dairy guys inject her with the next inseminator again right they don't wait for the full 7 months no calf is given they are only given milk for survival we all know the dairy business that's how it works because it's a it's it, it, you when you're sat for 9 months with a pregnant cow with no income once the cow starts giving milk every drop counts it's an it's a return on investment issue right for a person uh, so from day 1 the male calves have don't have a chance they are chucked out the females are needed for the next generation so they are on pair survival mode and within about a week 10 days 15 days they start actually by around 15 20 days they actually start grazing because there is very nothing they don't get any other food right it's actually we are forced to do and even the colostrum of the mother is soaked right and by the end of the fourth month first 15 days is colostrum the last about a, a, by 15 days the milk starts to become thinner the quality of milk starts to change and so they are inseminated again and all there's a big story to this so the long and short is it's actually not a very viable business in my opinion and if you think about it the demand is so high we really have to think do we really have that much capital that can provide the kind of demand we are looking at today so how much synthetic milk are we actually drinking i am not sure right and pressure now with a2 milk the pressure has become enormous on a, a cow that produces less milk to give as much as its predecessor which is ridiculous i mean the demand remains the same but you have switched to a cow that cannot give you anything beyond half of what the earlier one was the jersey cows were giving so eventually it's the, the burden is on the cow to keep producing and by the third or third pregnancy the cow is done if not earlier so anyway this this is the logic of the milk industry so i'm very clear that we need to start this dung project you know when the dung project started uh, i i i i saw these videos 8 years ago somewhere random on google about dung logs and it really caught my fancy because i said here look at this we are constantly talking about green planet we are constantly talking about green solutions and dung is something that is the most basic raw material i mean it's available to you 24/7 365 days of the year whether you want it or not right it is a no stress at all it it arrives whether you like it or not and every goshala has piles and piles of dung lying which they do nothing about every village has dung every house in a village that has a cow has dung so dung is something that is the that's free raw material of with no cost at all right and what if we do with it what are we doing with it we have stopped doing agriculture with it we have stopped building houses with it so the use of dung this decline while the amount of dung generated has gone up because of the kind of needs we have about regarding milk right every goshala is collecting money to keep cows but they do nothing to generate revenue right they just ask for donations and then function as glorified dairies most of them are functioning as glorified dairies so the point all this you know kind of drove me to see what can we do with dung and to my surprise i realized in nooks and corners of india people have come up with solutions already only it's not in one template so none of these machines are made by us it is already made by beautiful farmers from across india who uh, you know through just native intelligence have made it these are not iit graduates for instance the log machine is made by a farmer called mansuk bhai prajapati in gujarat now i think the national innovation foundation then took it from him and now i think a lot of people have started making their own log machines but this is where there are pots can be made logs can be made people are making all sorts of things and so we picked up three four things that we can make on the farm as a template and to showcase what you can do with dung yes if we have a dedicated team on the farm that works on this and we've trained two people on the farm who do this all day now and depending on season we we do it during uh, ganesh chaturthi before that we start making ganeshas for sustainable celebration of ganesh chaturthi or janmashtami so that people don't buy ganeshas and put them all into the yamuna so we try to start a narrative the dung project is a narrative for us it's the best narrative for 
environment friendly action you know and environment friendly action that is possible at every level at a village level at a goshala level it improves economy because it can create a parallel uh, income for a farmer or a farming community or a anganwadi uh, you know for a women self help group so for, as far as the logs are concerned wonderful option instead of cutting trees even an incinerator consumes some uh, amount of carbon footprint or create sorry some amount of carbon footprint so here is an option where a you generate income for somebody who needs it two you stop cutting trees because you have a secondary option it's a best out of waste project the raw material is available can be used locally there are cremation grounds everywhere so you don't have to i don't have to now send logs to chennai somebody in chennai should make this for the cremation grounds in chennai or in bangalore or in trivandrum and you to put it very very honestly uh, death is it's, i mean it's a it's a very sad to i mean i don't mean to say it in a bad way but it's something that you always need logs for your cremation grounds always need logs right so it's not a business that is dependent on anything it's just there right so if the but it is up to government to make these rules saying only or some percentage of options at least should be given to people of what they want to use whether they want to use uh, wood or dung logs or incinerators even such options are not mandatory and so although like you said we make so much at on the farm we do have trouble pushing it it's done with a lot of self advertisement or and social media posts on instagram or facebook and why every time i post we get of course some calls and then we have our own issues the dung logs are sometimes not as expensive as the courier charges uh, especially in the pandemic we had a lot of problems how do we actually transport these logs uh, so sometimes the dung log costs 150 but the transportation is 180 so small challenges like that but uh if this has to be if bijom could make it for our immediate crematorium we could easily make about 200 logs a day 300 logs a day at the minimum and like us if there are four organizations making it i think we can actually and it helps us because every single penny we earn goes back into running bijom goes back into feeding animals or looking after them or paying salaries or paying uh, for medical care or somewhere you know we uh, so it's wonderful it's a wonderful income generation activity and uh, but and it has to be it has to become uh, uh, every goshala no goshala should be permitted to run unless they have this kind of a uh, what can i say a uh, project where they should have an idea of what they are going to do with the dung they generate no uh, crematorium should run unless they have this option given to people who come to cremate uh, so that we always give a green option so i think the our efforts have to be married with policy uh, somewhere and that will help us enormously having said that it's lovely because i think the dungho project like you yourself said it's a very heartwarming project and and i think people have resonated with it it's not something we created in the sense i didn't create that machine but for me i uh, for somebody like me who who finds the situation of cows and dairy is pathetic i feel joy in this narrative because it opens people's eyes to something that shifts the topic from milk otherwise when you see a cow the first question everybody asks is kitni doodh deti hai they cannot look beyond milk right so for what the animal is worth and there is a problem another problem is we have neglected bulls completely because the issues always about milk uh, nobody talks about bulls any they talk about goshalas but bijom has a nandishal we have a nandishala bulls are absolutely they are all in the road or they are killed or they are uh, slaughtered sorry or they are uh, left and they die a natural death because they can't fend for themselves uh, because they have gone out of the of agricultural use technically as an animal although at one point they were the most important they were the fulcrum because there was no tractor without a bull a farmer couldn't function today they are just nobody talks about them right so that is why we cons- we are also doing a lot about nandi shalas on the farm people are surprised because we actually have about in our amongst our in our cattle shed we have about 100 50 cattle totally but out of which about 40 45 are male cattle are sans full uh, may 40 even 50 maybe full grown male cattle and looking after male cattle is a kala is actually uh, an art form 
it's not easy they are high testosterone large animals so they need to be cared for very differently from uh, cows but therefore we've also uh, seen that this project can help them to because if there is value for dung and if we can even make a difference under letting people know that there is some income from this they will look after barren cattle who can't uh, give birth any more who are thrown out from dairies they will look after old cattle uh, old cattle will find some value male cattle will find value uh, otherwise at the moment there only the cow has value amongst the bovines and all other animals are discarded so that is why i mean i think yeah like so like you're saying we do we for us we do have lots of stock like we have three sacks of seed balls at the moment we have about 200 logs as we speak yeah so we need to sell but with this narrative continuing and with a lot of social media exposure people are coming forward we do well during diwali when people buy cow dung gyas from us or uh, uh, ganesh chaturthi then there is a lull uh, you know for a while <laughs> so yeah Uh, i wanted to speak a little bit about man animal conflict so about uh, 18 years back on the foothills of munar there was this huge uh, uh, cardamom plantation which uh, came up for sale because uh, it had gone through years of uh, neglect because of heavy use of pesticides and all the trees there are over 50 60 feet high you know it's 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 really beautiful and of course the the owner didn't have any interest other than cutting the trees so a couple of fuss got together and we bought it uh with the sole purpose of protecting those trees and in these 18 years with mostly the natural means of restoration i think nature is so capable of rebuilding herself many a time she doesn't even need our help so the natural means of uh regeneration also have done wonders and of course uh geographically also it it has helped because it's right uh on the foothills of, uh, and it gets very good rainfall and all of that so now we are trying to do uh organic farming of cardamom because it's that altitude is best uh, for growing uh cardamom and uh what we find is that since the land has regenerated and the birds are back and uh, so much of flora and fauna are back along with that uh, our farm is now interesting to the elephant herds because uh, it's on the border of the forest so now it's you know what one feels about man animal conflict it is different when your own husband and son are on that land and digging and these herds of elephants show up it's very scary in 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 number one you don't want your husband and son to be harmed you don't want your plants to be harmed you don't want the elephant to be harmed either i don't want to put an electric fence and uh, so it, we are really caught so what what would you do aparna if if elephants uh, were interested in your ragi fields <laughs> we have other kind of predators on the farm predators in quotes uh, on the farm we have nil gai fortunately don't have monkeys and peacocks i keep saying because of the dogs on our farm we have our we have boars wild boars that uh, dig up all our potatoes or we have our own pig which ate all our haldi so the <laughs> destruction happens around us yes um there are two ways of uh, the the basic way of dealing with it is equanimity i think traditionally farmers were, uh, were they accepted a certain amount of invasion and accept and lived with it in some uh, some way to i i think the also the elephant corridors have been disturbed everywhere you know traditionally i don't think there was so much of conflict at all the demarcations were clear we are going more and more into forest lands and uh, disturbing corridors elephants have a certain path which and they are they are creatures of habit so their intention is not to destroy or come into human lands and in well evolved spaces they don't but wherever they do if you look at it historically the the corridor is broken or disturbed you know so it is it is a sad story because like you said Uh, we have to consider everybody here the man and the animal and uh, when farmers get desperate they resort to all sorts of terrible measures to deal with this um i don't know i think uh, personally you will have to rebuild a kind of a corridor collectively as a as a region uh, we have to maybe work with wildlife organizations who are good 
with understanding elephant behavior when i was in africa i spent 10 days in you know the masai mara uh, region and i just watched elephants for a much of the time and uh, the guys who were with us told us some absolutely fascinating stories about elephants how much they they know and think i think as farmers we then i need to understand elephant behavior you know you need to know your enemy simply that that's the best way to deal with it so uh, at least people like us who have the opportunity uh, maybe should learn or understand more about elephant behavior and that may give us clues about how to resolve this problem you can dig trenches uh, trenches are one thing they don't cross trenches if you dig, dig a trench along your farmland they will it will be tough for them to uh, cross over and slowly they'll change their path uh, that is one Uh, two i think they are attracted to food so obviously you need to create zones where they can get access to food like uh, i don't know about elephants because that is not something i'm familiar with but we do that in our farm with i have planted a lot of bear desi bear shatut and falsa kamrak and uh, you won't be karonda you won't believe it the birds don't touch our crops at all. because every season they have these trap crops which they feed on so i have never had a problem with the birds attacking our fruit they are very busy eating other things so maybe you could have a sugarcane kind of barrier at uh, the fringe in your last zone so that the elephants are content there and don't bother uh, coming in i'm not sure i'm just thinking but i do know trenches are an option um that is definitely because they they don't like trenches they won't step you know you should consult wildlife organizations like wildlife issues which have a uh, elephant project ongoing with them this could should become a study of how to manage no i i mean the way the way we see it is like uh, like i was asking in the beginning you know the, the core philosophy of getting into to this was to preserve the land and the trees so now when the elephants come for the fruit trees the first yeah. thing of the people there is cut the trees yes and yes yes you come back uh, you know it's like that is the very reason why you got into it and we are okay no in fact cutting the trees will only increase the problem section yeah and you can't do that i think that there is uh, there is a way uh, over the years we'll figure it out but there is no question of uh, you know um cutting the trees today just to uh, evade the the elephants no no not at all coming to again nothing is complete without you know uh, the pandemic and uh, the times that that we are in so i was uh, i was wondering whether the timing of bijo you know starting it in 2014 vis-a-vis maybe somebody who wants to do something now was the timing crucial in success is is this even an option today uh, that's number one and secondly it's even in terms of uh, you know the Uh, the sheer economics of things i mean uh, to buy land and uh, to be able to do farming around Na- noida is is there something which another person maybe not at this scale but a slightly smaller scale is it is it is it still an option or is it got outpriced you know the land prices have just shot up and it's, it's not an option mm. anymore the, there is no good time to start i think we, the the situation is so bad around the world with respect to food and environment and health i think uh, the every time is a good time but uh, i think 2014 when we started was i didn't realize but it was a very good time for me to start because the conversations of organic farming had just begun and we didn't realize at that point i had no clue and now when i look back i feel the time was right and um but the wave had just begun when people had started talking unfortunately although there is a lot of uh, whatsapp forwards and chatter and conversations uh, there we have a long way to go we aren't uh, if you actually look at statistics about how much percentage of uh, agriculture land is under natural farming it's very low uh, so people do need to start uh, and uh, even if you don't have farm land like me i i i, I have been lucky in many ways uh, a that i could start i i i i mean this opportunity came to me i think it's grace uh, i could have been stuck in some office uh, somewhere and uh, the fact that i chose to get out because i i i i was feeling stifled in a you know in mainstream uh, sitting at a desk and you know uh, this is me where i'm outdoors so i'm very grateful uh, for this opportunity that i have had to yes the fact that 
uh, I could uh, pr- generate the resources to help me develop this uh, project. I'm very conscious that um, I'm grateful that I could do it, but I'm also grateful that I had the uh, I had the desire to. Uh, use the resources I had this way than in any other way, and I'm glad I diverted it here. I I haven't done a lot of other things which I could have if I didn't divert it here, but I'd rather do this than anything else. So I'm deeply grateful. Uh, but I think it's not difficult to start. I'll tell you why. People can start from anywhere. It doesn't. You don't need to buy farm. Like I didn't buy farm land initially. I leased a bit of land. So I always encourage people saying, even if you can't start on your own, make a group, form a community, lease a land together, start it for the joy of starting. Uh, your learnings, share them in any way you can. It could be just your society or in your flat or in your apartment. It could be start on your terrace, on your balcony, on your. I know lots of people are doing lovely stuff on their balcony and actually sharing so much vital information on composting and uh, on uh, uh, growing food and uh, on the importance of eating fresh food. So I think there is. You can start from anywhere. Just the, and the the. What if we think of as as a curse today? Uh, of course, if, without so uh, without social media or without uh, uh, digital media, even what we are doing just now won't be possible. I think per se, social media by itself is not a wrong thing. I think it's just that we spend way too much time doing irrelevant stuff on it. Uh, so, if we could use social media well, it's actually today the reach is enormous, and that's how people are getting. To know uh, about work, each other. I've learned from so many people, just like that, because they post it, and I'm part of so many uh, Facebook groups on home gardening and composting. And I just scroll through them, and I have so much gyan after that because there's there's so much knowledge, right? So I feel uh, people can start in their home, day one, just composting. Growing in their balconies, growing microgreens, growing on their terrace, or forming a community and starting a community composting uh, uh, thing, or uh, leasing a land, or taking one empty plot of land in your uh, in your vicinity and converting it into a food garden, maintaining a park. Um, so one doesn't necessarily have to start large projects. Uh, you know, we just have to start. That's what I tell everybody. You know, I do. I uh, I really don't say that Bijom happened. I'm grateful, but I tell everyone take away anything that that is why we share so much because we want somewhere somebody to start something, whatever it is. I think that's called a revolution. Um, so uh, in schools, start their own school gardens. Uh, old age homes start their own food gardens. Uh, you know, even a colony um, plants more fruit trees or. Uh, native trees in their community uh, manage uh, you, you know uh, take back uh, barren empty lands waste lands around you clear it up and grow uh, stuff uh, you know uh, form environment clubs in your locality you could be participating in this whole movement in so many ways i, I can't even uh, i mean it's a, it's a, it's amazing so that's what i keep telling people i think we don't have to think so far like everybody has to buy land uh, there's a lot more we can do uh, in every aspect and, and if you can buy land or uh, you more than buying you know i think we need to re green our environment so take green belts uh, empty plots uh, barren land negotiate with your local authorities councils uh you know help them go to schools talk i mean so i that's what i keep telling people that uh, um you don't really have to buy and if you can do or start as a group so so here uh, in 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 bangalore uh, what is now very popular is the is the csa model you know the customer supported uh, agriculture we have uh, navdarshnam and groups like that who are doing a, a very good job and we're all part of that so uh, i wanted to know because you also have a csa model right you, you do to have in from your community uh, people who have signed up for a, a box every week um, is that the engine which has helped you get through some difficult times during the the pandemic yes. my god yes definitely earlier we were I, earlier i was very clear that i won't take uh, i won't go door to door not for any other reason 
my whole desire was to get people out of their homes to bijo uh i wanted them to come to bijo i wanted them to step out uh i wanted them to come in not just to buy vegetables that is of course important for us but when they come the it's an immediate recharge for them they uh, hang come with families uh instead of going to the mall or uh, a movie uh, a, a, an evening in a farm uh, is very invigorating fresh air the they get they get to know urban people are so out of touch with their food uh, so i felt that delivering that carrot to their doorstep that was my first uh, first few years this was my thought so we never did the csa model we were very clear that farmers that everyone comes you meet your farmer create have your family farmer talk to your farmer you know look at your produce in the field this was my uh, you know what romantic ideology of and then covid struck so so this whole objective of getting people to bijo became tough uh, and so we started the csa basket where we said okay at least let the basket to them at least let the clean food reach where it has to reach uh, so it has helped us enormously in the pandemic uh at least our vegetables get to places we hate seeing vegetables uh, uh go waste when we have a surplus of especially sags which i find is the toughest to move in the north um i don't know about the south but the uh, in the north summer sags particularly people are not used to it so we have to do a lot of support of people eating sags in summer it's considered a winter vegetable where they eat methi and sarso sag right so when we have surplus we give it to the gurudwara for their lumber uh we make sure the produce reaches somewhere but yes the csa basket and our saturday farmers market these have been very good for us uh, you know growing is addictive we can't stop growing we are waiting to grow and uh, also once you learn to grow you know and you learn to grow well you can't not grow there is a soil is waiting for you and the season is there uh, so growing is never a problem now after 8 years i'm so grateful about you know to to be able to grow at least about 83 84 crops on the farm through the year selling is a problem especially with the pandemic and various other factors so also the fact that people have now gotten used to uh uh online uh, uh ordering online so most people don't even come out at their homes homes now physically to uh, buy uh, lifestyle a because people are busy they are working two we have a pandemic which is there even apart from the pandemic the habit of buying online is so uh, now become so entrenched that nobody wants to go all the way to a farm to buy vegetables so we that is why the saturday market is very important i want people to come so yes the csa model has worked for us and this gives us a a, a beautiful a regular income coming in uh to the farm our vegetables go uh out to the right uh places and but we've had a problem because we can't guarantee vegetables any no natural farm can guarantee what vegetables will go we ourselves forage that's the truth okay we go out every we every friday into the field and we are surprised ki are there is this this is standard fruiting you know uh, so we actually pick up on the move while we are uh, whatever is ready for the week uh, so it's tough to find those people who can vibe with that many people expect that that tokri will contain what they want so this pitch is different we have to tell them that this is as much a surprise for us as it is for you so it's a foraged tokri so that's why we've called us us our tokri todi tales todi is backyard so the pitch is uh, you don't have a backyard but you get the vegetables like it's from your backyard yeah. so that's uh, yeah so that is the that's spirit true. of the csa actually that you will buy whatever yeah. is produced yes. organic whatever is available season. whatever he produces actually yes. sometimes it could be uh, in the season it just might not happen and, yeah mm-hmm. there are very lean season sometimes and the basket is only half full and then we we put in grains we put in a bucket bottle of achar we put in whatever else to make up but we tell them that then but we will make up for it in the better season where you get full baskets so it's a matter of trust and uh, support okay. basically so yeah. so in the, on the farming side uh bicho has really benefited from the uh, the experience and the practices of farmers all over india right there 
there are people from from bihar there are people from orissa there and with them have come their their practices their traditional seeds i think you were talking about a beautiful swan shaped loki and there are so many interesting things which have come because you have such a diverse group but with people invariably uh, what i find is comes the the challenge of uh, man management i mean see when you start on barren land there are very low expectations people don't even expect you to succeed they almost expect you to fail and then over the years it changes and you go on to do so well so with that also comes a rise in expectations so sometimes uh, uh you have a bit of i mean each of us has a a, a glorified uh, estimation of how we have contributed to its success unfortunately so and it's only natural to to want a bigger share so how do you handle that because you for you your farmers and the people who work with you are very integral to the team so, but these challenges uh, can't be done away with so it's very interesting although these were they are all farmers from across india i think they woke up after coming to bijo literally as a group because where they are young boys and where they are coming from from across india their uh, their uh, families are now doing chemical farm that is the sad uh, uh, truth of all our farmers today the second uh, reason is most of them not all there are some groups like the group from madhya pradesh which uh, is doing more diversity in their lands but naturally because that they, they are from the jungle area but a lot of other farmers although they uh, they initially i had this idea let me begin this way that farmers means they know everything once the farmers arrive i realized most of them only know two three crops it was a shock to me i mean my naivety because i i didn't know right i you presume farmers means of course they know how to grow but uh, most for instance in western up any local farmer would know about six crops that's it because it's monocrop in most places right they grow wheat they grow paddy they grow mustard they grow urad moong and uh, sarso and that's about it is they stay within their and ganna they stay within that a thing so when you suddenly say bak when you suddenly say bathu i don't bathu what am i saying till or uh, when you suddenly say uh, kulat or when you are suddenly saying buckwheat uh, or uh, uh, millets you know when i first grew millets in hapur in this land all the locals came and asked me what is this? when i when i grew ragi they could identify oh yeah. really they know bajra and jowar because that they grow here but that is for fodder they don't need any more they don't need bajra anymore right so they uh, they looked at the ragi plants and said what is this then one old man said when i was young they used to eat this so i realized that the farmers have limitations to be because a they are monocropping especially the young crowd has very little knowledge of this diversity so that was the first shock to me they also woke up after coming here because they suddenly realized Oh God! Yes, of course. Let me go back. So now they started going back home and talking to their uh, elders in the farm, in their homes, and they started coming back with knowledge, and they started coming back with ideas. Then, of course, their own field experience became. Uh, they, they are naturals. It's not that they are already there because they are already farmers. It's not. I mean, uh, they, they. It's there in their DNA already, right? We. It was like. literally in hindi saying jagrit karna tha ko types now huh? because they already are farmers so they are they, they they you don't have to teach them how to farm but what they had what had died in their in their system was diversity or what we what i wanted to grow i wanted to grow everything uh, like i i went to uh, when i started you know i didn't know i can do all this i i just i went the first thing i did when i got this land was i asked the local guys ab kya bo sakte hain There's a mooli, so I planted whole five acres of mooli, and they didn't know how to sell it because they all happened at the same time. I didn't even know that mooli one year it will happen, and I was just thinking, what the hell do I do with five acres of mooli? And I sold it for two thousand rupees. So, <laughs> so we started very with absolutely zero knowledge, right? So when I started, when I went to a party somewhere, and there was an elderly lady I was chatting with. She said, "My husband worked in a." 
sugar factory yet. when she heard i'm farming she got very excited and she said my husband works in a sugar factory and we are two acres i do everything but salt that clicked in my head <laughs> i said how lovely to grow everything but salt but i didn't know how so i came back and became my project let's grow everything ha huh? but the next challenge was what would grow when and where in the northern in the northern plains again then india is not one climate india has got so much geography so i would read some karnataka ka crop calendar it did nothing for me because the north is a completely different temperature cycle right so it was a big project in our, for us and all these boys who came not knowing uh, or not having thought about it started thinking so i think frankly we all just got excited as a group about what all can we grow then they started going back home and they said ma'am hamare yahan wo hota hai let me bring the seeds then i said wonderful bring it and they started bringing native seeds they started bring, somebody would bring arbi somebody would bring a type of kela uh, and i then i jokingly made a rule saying no one can come back without <laughs> without stuff i said if you want to go on holidays then you have to come back with something from your house it became like a joke but they took it very seriously you know so they would come back with a kind of taro uh, which is very beautiful you know which I, they and they tell me you can eat rattalu which is a potato somebody came with then somebody will come with a kind of haldi or a shakarkandi variety which i have not uh, seen uh, a, a millet variety from their area so that is how they started participating in this knowledge collection and um we also started with two three crops because we didn't know nobody knew any better we were all elbows literally and over eight years now we started growing more like for instance we wanted to grow rajma okay in western up rajma is not grown it's grown in the hills it is not grown in the plains okay and around is nobody grows rajma so when do we grow rajma first time we grew it in november the plant came nothing happened right then we grew it in december because we knew at least plant to paya na now let's say. finally we cracked it it was mid jan so it took us three seasons <laughs> to uh, figure out how to grow rajma in ncr right so many of these uh, some we took i took the help of some agriculture website uh, kahi ka googled like mad uh figured out asked to elderly people when to grow uh, and kind of estimated suppose something is growing in the hills we'll have these discussions on the farm when i say i i, I don't mean just me it's always a big discussion on the farm so i'll say suppose we want to grow uh, something that's growing in the hills we'll check kaun se temperature mein it's growing in the hills and we'll try and replicate it uh, in that temperature here so we were doing our own so can you imagine this bunch of youngsters with me all of us didn't know much because but they were real farmers and i was the r and d research assistant there and that is how today we are now growing the 83 crops so it's been a journey that is not mine alone it's been a collective journey and i think everybody got en- en- uh, enthusiastic because it became a learning uh, template for all of us so if something germinated we got excited something failed we'll all be very sad about it things <laughs> bar hua nahi so now uh, uh, we, you can safely say that they have regenerated their own knowledge systems and now they say that yes so then the elderly farmers who came to work with us we saw, then we got some elderly people working with us who would tell us that in our childhood this is how it was and we would like for instance i grew rocket the first time on the farm none of my farmers had seen rocket right they had not even seen this i didn't they didn't know such a thing uh, existed and when i said it's used in salads they were like really and the concept of a raw salad doesn't i mean uh, uh, using rocket one old man uh, old farmer called tezram he walked by and he said ye kya hai i said it's something i thought i was being in from i was giving him information so i said this is rocket you know it's actually a videshi herb and you eat it in salads <laughs> he said this is to grow in our village wild rocket that was wild rocket what i grow he said the seeds we take out oil from i had never heard of this so for, uh, it was so things happened as we spoke on the farm and uh, flax seeds 
alsi ka tel uh, i i i was so bad initially i didn't even realize that linseed oil then i had to google everything and understand that what is uh, cool as flaxseed today is nothing but linseed oil and it's nothing but what is used uh, in non edible spaces you know so like that i think that's how the knowledge systems grew so these farmers have been invaluable because they kept going back and kept referring and coming back uh, and uh, wholly participated in this effort of creating our crop gap one final question and which is that okay from aparna the lawyer there is now aparna the farmer and i'm sure that you still have so many more interests because you are a self learner is there is there time for the other aparnas in your life is there time for all of those or is this becoming all consuming is it possible to have time no not at all no no there's time or there's time always for everything i think it's about how we manage our uh, time yeah there are seasons where i'm consumed uh, harvest sowing uh, uh, but i very consciously uh, make an effort to do lots of other things i love to cook uh, i very I, i mean i think if you're growing food you will love to cook too <laughs> i love to cook food it's lovely i i love the whole uh, of trying out new things i love to do handicraft i love handicraft i i learned uh, i learned i've been learning knitting for years i'm not good at it but i dabble with it because it gives me a lot of therapy uh, now i'm learning crochet from my daughter who is very good uh, and uh, i love to sing i learned music for a long time as a child and it's one of my, i although i don't sing as much the last few months i haven't done a lot of singing but yes i think i love to read reading i love to read so i think yeah there's enough time for it and you have to one thing is uh, what i started doing after bijom began is i became a homestead so that automatically means you do a lot of other things uh we pickle we preserve we dehydrate um uh, and all these are very joyful activities i don't see it as a job or a chore uh i think uh, it's and uh, i think we have to be busy uh, the one thing that it this does for you is there is no time to be bored uh, uh 24 hours aren't sometimes enough but in a very happy way i i don't think it's uh, uh, I, i mean it's it's not made me stressed or you know it's not overwhelmed me i try i there are times yes. we have been animals are sick then uh, you know we have that doesn't have its own challenges we do have challenges but they are transient they come and go and um, things become better and uh, so i think we what uh, maybe farming teaches you the most is equanimity uh, and we are that's a, that's something we all it's a, it's a it's a process it's a, i'm i'm learning it uh, where you know you let nature uh, take its course <laughs> and uh, there's lots to do and i think the homesteading bit really appeals to me so i'm learning a lot of skills um uh, uh, which i didn't have uh, you know like i said so upscaling stuff and uh what can i say that's a lot of lot of lovely work um and bottling canning uh these are all beautiful skill sets Yeah, oh, it's beautiful all the way. Apna, yours is a story of immersion. There is nothing on the sidelines. Everything is uh, go all out uh, and make it happen. It's it's beautiful. It's creative. It's innovative. Uh, it's uh, joy all the way. Uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, mindfulness is something that we can yeah, it's something. It's a it's a dream <laughs> to be present and happy. Yeah, I think that is the only way to. do this i think the reason you are able yeah. to do so much is because uh, you are very mindful of uh, every everything in your life and it and it comes from a space of joy and of love and of sharing right it's, yeah yeah and and uh, it's not to say that there aren't challenges i keep saying this but i don't think uh, anything is uh, bijom has lots of challenges when i speak all this it doesn't mean we don't have challenges to have so many animals and people working in one place you can imagine it presents its own uh, but that is part of the uh, whole uh, there are challenges in any any environment uh, but the beautiful thing is how you approach the challenge i think uh, this has also taught me a lot of uh, how to like you said man management uh, people management animal management mind management uh, <laughs> uh, we are constantly learning yeah 
Yeah, <laughs> tremendous amount of personal growth also there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Aparna. Uh, it's such so wonderful to speak to you. The, the whole story of uh, Bijom is so, so authentic and so, uh, so much to learn. I, I really hope that we uh, get a chance to come and visit you uh, at the farm. Uh, so I would love to meet, so. uh, visit you and uh, see Navadarshanam also. You must yes. know it was part of my learning curve. I'm sure. I read about Navadarshanam and uh, I, I, those were all the Timbapu Collective, yeah. Navadarshanam, Aranya. These have all been part of my learning curve. And uh, I think this, I've learned from so many people. It's just incredible. So I'd love to come to Navadarshanam, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Pana. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarunaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.